Well, I'm really looking forward to today's webinar from uh, Nilesh Bhatia, mainly because I've had a sneaky look at it in advance. And I know it's packed full of useful information. And also because I know that if you have even a superficial knowledge of this subject, it can save you so much trouble in your professional career. Being on the end of the telephone to several hundred dental practices, I have a very good idea of the distress caused by even the first stage of a complaint, uh, let alone when it gets further up the line to the General Dental Council. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards, so if anything is unclear, you can watch this again. But uh, I'll mention during the presentation, feel free to type comments or questions into the chat box and I will put them to Neelish at the end. So, in great anticipation, Neelish, over to you. Thank you very much, Derek. I um, hope you can all hear me okay. Um, as you can, I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see the, the slides that I'm going to be working through, um, which are just, just the bullet points so I can talk around those issues. Um, the first thing, first slide is just to show you roughly what I'm going to try and cover within the next um, 30 minutes or so. I may not be that long, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have at the end. Um, Derek um, did provide a brief introduction to me, but this is, this is me. I am, I'm a qualified solicitor of some seven years. I have been doing this work, um, which is exclusively defending clinical negligence claims against doctors and dentists and nurses um, for the entirety of my professional life. Um, and we cover here at Waitman's huge variety of medical disciplines, um, but I have a particular interest in dental claims myself. Um, I've kind of a bit of a niche for them within the firm, but also from a personal perspective, um, my wife is a dentist, um, we own a practice, or she owns a practice, um, so I do have some experience of what it's like at the coalface um, at your end. But um, typically, you know, the work I do can be uh, ranging in value, as I said on the screen, from anything with a few thousand pounds for the small sort of dental claims or very small minor claims to multi-million pound catastrophic um, injury claims. Uh, we act on behalf of public sector bodies within NHS hospitals, but also on behalf of private indemnity insurers. Um, and for those, um, I deal with dentists, osteopaths and um, cosmetic treatment providers. We as a firm, a large national firm, uh, within the top 50 uh, largest law firms in the country. We offer a full service of commercial insurance and public sector services. Um, healthcare is obviously the area that I'm interested in. Um, we have a very big team and a very good team across the country and are highly respected in this area along with public sector work generally. We have a very strong commercial presence, um, so as well as um, claims um, and work of that nature, we do offer employment and commercial services if anybody has any uh, need for uh, selling purchases of practices, property, that sort of thing as well. Um, but within the healthcare um, sector, as well as the litigation, uh, which I'm going to speak to you briefly on, um, we also uh, act for medical professionals before their regulation bodies, such as the GMC, GDC, uh, General Autocratic Council, and so on. We provide representation and inquests, and also advise a wide range of general healthcare um, topics such as consent, emergency treatment and data protection. So just to crack on with the main focus of our, our presentation today, uh, um, you hopefully haven't been involved with any claims because it's not a particularly pleasant experience. I'm just going to explain roughly what a patient has to establish. Um, claims that can be brought in either negligence or in contract because every dentist has a contract with a patient, uh, whether it's expressly set out as a contract or not, you are providing the contract for the services. But more commonly, the claims that we see are brought in negligence. If you ever see a claim in contract, the basic principle is to restore the claim back to the physician or the patient back to the physician as if the contract had not been breached. Uh, these claims are generally more limited in, in value but we often see them made side by side with a negligence claim, which is to restore the patient to the position as if the negligence had not been committed. Now, negligence is really the focus um, of most claims. And in order to establish negligence, the tenant has to prove that there is a duty of care that the dentist owes. 
that there has been a breach of that duty, that breach has caused a loss. So there has been some damage and there has been a loss to the patient. You may be familiar with the Berlin Principle from any courses you've been on or from when um, you studied dentistry at undergraduate level, the BDS. But the basic principle of clinical negligence is set out in this case authority called Bolum and Free and Hospital Management Committee. It's a very old case, but it is still the law. And I just put on there the quote from the leading judgment by the judge in that, in that case, um, which I'll summarize briefly, which is basically that in order to prove negligence, a patient has to demonstrate that a dentist has acted out with that of the responsible body of medical opinion or dental opinion. And that is exactly that is the key principle that governs any clinical negligence claim. And also to highlight that you can be in a minority of opinion, providing you can find a body of opinion that supports you. So for example, if there is a groundbreaking so groundbreaking um, leading technique um, in dental surgery or dental treatment that is not widely spread, it's not widely accepted, but there is a body that is practicing that, then that is perfectly legitimate and we can not succeed if you can demonstrate that there is a body that will support what you are doing, providing that there is a responsible body. There's also another case which is very important that governs clinical negligence claims that even if the claimant establishes that there is a body of responsible opinion that would not have supported the actions that are complained of, they must have to get over another hurdle, which is that the treatment complained of must withstand logical scrutiny. And I just highlighted on there um, the case of Belitha, which um, sets out this key principle, um, and the key bullet, the bullet point set out what the rough nature of the case was uh, a two-year-old child complaining of breathing difficulties in hospital. They deteriorated the day after admission on two separate occasions. A nurse called the doctor on the telephone, but the doctor did not attend. On those two occasions, the child recovered, according to the records, but at a later stage, the child suffered from cardiac arrest and acquired brain damage. The doctor who was telephoned earlier and did not attend, gave evidence to the effect that even if she had attended, she would not have intubated the child, as was alleged should have been done. The allegation was that the child should have been intubated in order to avoid the damage and to restore the breathing. Therefore, the court held that a body of opinion would not be responsible where the court finds illogical or unable to withstand analysis. So even if she had attended, would have not made any difference to the outcome because she would not have done what was alleged should have been done. And that was perfectly reasonable. So in this case, the breach of duty element was established, but not the causation element. And just going on from that, this is exactly what the three components of negligence, Clemenasi Travis breach of duty, and that this materially contributed or caused some harm. There has to be some loss in order for them to receive any damages. And all three components, breach, causation and loss, must be satisfied for there to be a valid claim. Now, this slide just sets out some of the common allegations in dental claims that I have worked on. And none of those should be a surprise to you. Um, but I'm just going to run through them very Briefly, a very common one is a failure to obtain informed consent. Now, consent is a law, area of law all by itself, but um, you'll be aware that a patient must give consent, and must give valid consent, in order for them to perform any treatment. Now, some of this can be implied, so please open your mouth, or I'm just going to do this, um, and providing there are no objections to that, you couldn't do your job unless the claimant did give implied consent. Um, in other cases, you would have to have express written informed consent um, demonstrated by a consent form 
or some other way of demonstrating that the patient has received the information in order for them to take a decision on their treatment. Another very common area of negligence, or alleged negligence, I should say, um, is that not enough radiographs are taken, or the ones that are taken are not adequate. Um, it's amazing how often this crops up, that the allegation is that well, had the dentist taken the x-ray, this would have led to the diagnosis, which would have led to the treatment, and this treatment would not have failed, or the treatment would have been completed as it should have been done. It's also not uncommon for dentists to treat the wrong, wrong tooth. Again, mistakes can be made, um, but that is something to be aware of. I've had cases where the wrong tooth has been extracted um, in error, um, and that's the sort of case that we can't really defend very robustly. Another common area is the choice of treatment, or the execution of treatment is poor, um, and this often comes down to expert evidence as to whether um, for example, you know, a root canal treatment should have been offered or not, a crown should have been offered or not, an implant should have been offered or not, or exactly what the best course of treatment for that, this particular treatment of uh, the particular patient was. Going on from that, there's often an allegation that the patient hasn't been given all the options in order to provide their informed consent. And so this is often linked to the consent allegation. The patient cannot give informed consent unless they know all the options, and if the dentist has missed out a key option, or one of the options that may, they may have taken, then they could be criticised for it. Now, by far and away the most common allegation in most clinical negligence actions is related to record keeping. And I put out, I set out the key errors that are often made um, in relation to dental work. Quite often, the dental notes are too brief. I'll speak to the dentist afterwards who will say that this consultation lasted 30 minutes or 45 minutes, but there are often only three or four lines worth of notes, and even they are abbreviated and, and very brief. Um, often they can be incomplete and not reflect the entirety of the discussion. There can be inaccurate charting, which could be down to you or could be down to your assistant or nurse. But the key thing in relation to record keeping is that how can the dentist justify what he or she did quite often years afterwards if a claim or complaint is brought? And in the event that we need to obtain expert evidence, how can the independent expert comment on whether the action is taken or reasonable if there is not enough information or incomplete information to go on? And allied to the other examples, what well, notes are often missing, X-rays are often missing and not taken, the correspondence isn't available, the consent forms aren't available, and this adds to a picture which even if technically the claim could be defended, if you don't have the evidence to back it up, then more often not, you would have to settle the claim on the dentist's behalf. Now, before a claim gets to the court proceeding stage, you may receive what's known, or you may go through what's known as the pre-action protocol stage. Court proceedings are not yet issued, but there is a protocol that is followed by both the claimant, or on behalf of the claimant, and on behalf of the defendant dentist. Quite often, solicitors will be involved by this stage, but that's not necessarily the case. But the, the protocol is essentially that in writing, by a letter of claim, the patient or, on, or the patient's uh, solicitors will set out the basis of the claim with a chronology, with the allegations that are likely to be made on breach of duty, on causation, possibly what the value of the claim is at that stage, and also how the claim is being funded, whether it's an insurance policy, whether it's one of these no win, no fee agreements. Um, but you, we will know at that early stage, or we should know at that early stage, how the claim is being funded. In response to that, uh, we will investigate the allegations, we will contact the dentist, we will obtain the notes, and we may, at an early stage, obtain an expert report to comment on the allegations. By the time the letter of claim is received, more often than not, the claimant already has the benefit of expert evidence, 
and something beneficial for us to take an early view as to whether there is a case to answer or not. Um, you'll also be aware that before we get to this stage, the claimant is entitled to receive copies of their medical records, clinical records, along with the correspondence, consent forms, and essentially anything that exists uh, in relation to their treatment. This is an opportunity, this uh, protocol stage, the actual protocol stage, to resolve matters between the parties at an early stage before the costs really escalate. Um, and in the response, you can admit that you're liable, you can admit in part that you're liable, or you can deny and that you've got a good and say that you've got a good defence. If there is still an issue between the parties and you can't resolve the matters at this stage, then the claimant has the option of taking the matter further and issuing court proceedings. There is a time limit for this, and in, and, and in generic terms, that period is three years from the start of the treatment complained of. Um, again, limitation can be a difficult issue, so I won't go into detail in, in this session, but just bear in mind that there is generally a three year limitation on claims for personal injury or clinical negligence. If court proceedings are issued, this is when things become formal and they become much more expensive to deal with. The claim will be set out in a, usually a very detailed document called the Particulars of Claim, which may be very similar to the Letter of Claim or maybe modified depending on further investigations or the nature of the response that has been submitted on behalf of the defendant. Usually with the Particulars of Claim, we will receive a schedule that sets out roughly what the claimant um, is seeking to recover in terms of financial loss and a report from an expert which gives the claimant's prognosis, the current condition and future prognosis. At this stage, we will not see the liability report which sets out why the expert thinks that the dentist was uh, could be criticised or was negligent. We will only see the prognosis report at this stage. And again, similar to the uh, letter of response, we have the opportunity to put forward the dentist's defence with or without the benefit of expert evidence and we are obliged to respond to each and every allegation that is made in the particulars of claim. The next formal stage is the exchange of witness statements which would be one part of the dentist or the nurse or both um, and that sets out the factual position and we will literally exchange it by sending your statement um, or the dentist statements in the post uh, we will receive the patient statements in response at the same time. The next formal stage is exchange of expert evidence, where again, literally, we put our expert report in the post and the patient solicitors do that on the same day and everyone sees what each other's cases are at the same time. The next formal stage is the experts of the respective parties will meet and let you know the issues as much as possible and they will either agree or disagree on, on um, the issues that are set out in the uh, particular claim and the defence. The schedule of loss will be finalised, which sets out the claimant's claim, and uh, we can put forward our own cash schedule to say, we agree that she needs the implant, but the only is going to cost this much, or we agree that she needs one implant rather than three, and this is what the cost should be. And again, you know, we review the evidence at every stage and only as a last resort will a matter proceed to trial. It's already aware any case you get to trial, it's very stressful, it's very costly, and lawyers' jobs are generally to try and keep cases out of court if possible. This is contrary to the popular opinion, but if the claimant has a case, then we should be settling it. If they don't, then we should be persuading them to go away. So the trial is very much a last resort and I would estimate less than 1% of the cases ever get to the door of the court. But the costs can be substantial as you get up to trial. Um, for example, dealing with the case at the moment, which is essentially to do with an allegation that the dentist has negligently caused an oral antral uh, fistula, which is worth probably no more than £5,000, but even at this very early stage, which is at the pre-action stage, um, the costs could reach £50,000, so just gives you 
administration as to how the costs can rack up. And that's based on the basic principle that the winner pays, the, uh, so the winner recovers their costs from the loser. So if the patient wins the case, or the case is settled, then your insurers or you personally would have to pay the claimant's legal costs as well as the costs of the damages. The value of a claim can vary hugely, um, but they're essentially composed of general damages, which is for the pain and suffering, or special damages, which is the out-of-pocket financial expenses. And I've set out the, the key areas that are often claimed in relation to dental claims. So, for example, um, if the cost, uh, so if the claimant needs further treatment to rectify what has gone wrong, then they need to recover that. As well as, as well as any ancillary expenses, such as loss of earnings if they have to take time off work to have that work done, and so on and so forth. The next three slides just give you a flavour of the types of awards that can be awarded. And um, we'll just leave that on there for a minute just so you can read it. But this is a fairly low value and fairly typical kind of claim. This was a, an eight year old girl who had the four upper teeth extracted rather than the four lower teeth. Um, and you'll see from the slide that she suffered from physical discomfort and sensitivity, impaired appearance given her age, and um, some speech impediments. Um, and for a child, um, the fluid dentist uh, exacerbated because the wrong teeth were extracted. So that settled in 2007 for the equivalent of about £4,000 um, in today's money. The next slide is a slightly more complex, uh, complex case uh, and a higher settlement. But again, this is an out-of-court settlement. Uh, these aren't my cases, by the way. These are just cases that have been reported um, and are available to, uh, to lawyers generally. Um, and again, in, you know, um, between you know, so seven or eight years, in this case, this uh, delegation's uh, spanned. Um, you see the brief nature of the case on the slide. An older patient this time, 52-year-old woman, and she received £14,000 um, in an out of court settlement. And you see the nature of the allegations there at the bottom and why that case may have been settled. The next slide is a much higher value case, £123,000, treatment spanning some 20 years. Um, and again, I'll leave that to for you to read. And I'm happy to send it to anybody a copy of my slides if they wish to see them at a later stage. Um, just to give the time constraints, I won't go through these in, in detail. But again, you know, this is probably quite rare, but there is a value attached to a claim which is of this magnitude, but it's not unknown. Um, and each case is taken on its own merits. But for a case of this nature, obviously a large number of teeth, long period of treatment, a lot of suffering, and a lot of remedial work. So again, nothing I say is going to be, um, should come as a surprise to you. It's not, there's nothing magic in what I'm saying, but in terms of handling complaints and, and claims, um, the key thing is to try and move it in the bud at a very early stage. If you receive a complaint, deal with it quickly, provide a full response, have a complaints policy, which you should have anyway, in view of your CQC requirements, but follow the complaints policy, Make sure your staff know what it is and what they should be doing to follow the, the policy. Communication is of absolute paramount importance. Make sure it is clear. Make sure it is prompt. Make sure that the patient's concerns are addressed. And if it needs to be, then meet with the patient in person and go through their concerns and respond to them. The number of claims that can be nicked on the bed at this stage is quite significant and you should not have to receive any further correspondence or contact with the patients, aside from all technical reasons, um, if the complaint is handled in the right manner. Um, as well as addressing their concerns, if remedial work can be provided uh, relatively um, quickly and if it's straightforward, then you should do so. Don't be afraid to apologise, because that's quite often what patients are really seeking. Just to acknowledge that something has gone wrong, you're prepared to acknowledge that and that something will be done about it. The only caveat to this, from a legal perspective, 
is make sure that you are familiar with your indemnity insurance policy because that may prevent you from admitting liability or taking any steps that are tantamount to admitting liability. And if you're ever in doubt, report it to your insurers before you do any work or before you take any significant action. Um, that's quite important just because insurers have the right to say, you know, you didn't comply with the requirements of notification, we're not going to cover the claim, um, and we don't just get to the stage where the dentist is personally responsible for the claims, it becomes very expensive um, and very stressful. But as a matter of good practice, you know, if you handle a complaint properly and quickly and well, then that should be the end of the matter. You should retain the care of the patient and to continue a clinical relationship with them, um, and there should be no mention of a claim in the future. And just following on from that, I've mentioned communication and the importance of that, but whilst before you get to that stage, from the outset, when the patient first comes and sees you, make sure the communication is good from the outset, it's clear, everyone knows exactly what is going to be done and why, give an honest, comprehensive appraisal of the state of their teeth, um, give them all of the treatment options for the relevant costs, so there can be no doubt they know exactly what's going to happen and why and what's going to cost them. Set out the risks and benefits of each option, but ultimately it doesn't matter for them to make the decision. You may be asked what you would do in their position, but you can't really give that advice. That is a matter for the patient who wants to have the benefit of knowing the options the costs and the risks and benefits of each of them. It's quite useful often to provide a written estimate of the costs or the discussion that's taken place, provide a report at the end, um, either verbally in the appointment or in writing um, at a later stage. Training your staff is, is very, very important. That goes for the reception staff, practice manager, as well as the nursing staff because good customer service starts from the moment they walk into the practice and doesn't stop until they, they leave the practice. Try and obtain a signed consent form so there is no question that they have been given the information on which to make a decision. Make sure that the records are clear, make sure they're accurate, make sure they're contemporaneous and as comprehensive as they can be within the time scales and the constraints that we're under. Consider taking an x-ray whenever it can be clinically justified because that will give you a much better basis to make a diagnosis and provide the treatment that you think is necessary and the patient should be shown the x-ray and explain exactly what you can see and what your clinical judgment is. And quite often, the last point on there is quite important, um, dentists are often prepared to take work which they really shouldn't be doing, either because they've been pressurised by the patient or just because they have um, to make an estimation as to what their abilities really are. That's not to criticise them in particular, it can often happen, but don't be afraid to say, I'm sorry, I think you're better off being served by a specialist, and I'll make that referral because it is not within my skill set. So just to round up, the key messages from the presentation is that the famous culture, um, which is very much in the media, um, and is very much alive. It's very different to how it was even five or ten years ago. Patients are much more willing to complain. Patients are more willing to make claims. They're much more aware of their rights. However, that doesn't mean that you should practice defensive dentistry. Generally, the risk of claims is still quite low, but in any profession, uh, the legal profession is not excluded from this, the risk is still relatively low and you should still do what is in the best interest of the patient with the caveat that you should have the culture in mind and to document and go through the process as much as possible. The importance of good communication cannot be stressed often enough. The patient should know exactly what is happening to them, why it is necessary and what the options are and the consequences of each of those options. Now, I'm happy to answer any questions at all in the time that remains, um, but I hope that the presentation has been useful. Um, even outside of the presentation, my details uh, are on the uh, website, 
that we can get them from the website and um, I can deal with any queries outside of the seminar if you wish. That's great, Neelish. Thank you very much. Uh, I and thanks for sharing your um, expertise with us. The uh, webinars are an excellent opportunity, I think, for people to get the benefit of uh, the expertise of the people who are really sort of working close to the, in your case, the complaints machinery. If I could just ask you a question, and then we've got a couple of questions that have been put to us by the audience. Um, there's going to be a big change, I think, in April this year in the sort of so-called no win, no fee arrangements with the lawyer's expenses coming out of any damages awarded as opposed to the dentist paying the costs. So how much of an impact is that going to have, do you think, in particular in discouraging more sort of speculative claims? Um, I think um, it should have, in, in time, it should have a big impact. I think it may, may take some time for the implications of that, of, of the change in the, the process to filter through, um, because there's going to be, there are going to be a lot of claims which are going to be issued in court um, before the 1st of April, um, which will still run through the course um, in, the, in the system. But um, overall, we're, we're hoping that change bills should go down, and hopefully the number of claims that should be should be reduced because it's much less of an incentive for those claims to be brought. Um, so that, that's very much the picture at the moment. We're still waiting to see the impact, but the theory is that there should be less claims, or fewer claims, um, and the cost of those claims should come down. Now, we've had a question from a member of the audience who says, why, if most claims are under £100,000, are people insured for £10 million or some other... I mean, an amazing sum, because all of the, some of the things you did mention, like uh, being represented at inquests and uh, being involved in yes. cases where multiple deaths are ensue, uh, really don't apply to dentists, do they? They do tend to have the smaller claims. You're right, they, have, they do, absolutely. I think, um, um, from, I don't know the exact figure, um, but I think there is a minimum requirement from the GDC as to what your insurance levels should be, um, and I think the insurance policies generally follow that. But I've seen insurance policies that are provide, provide up to, say, £10 million pounds worth of cover. Um, and the reason for that, again, highly unusual, I would have thought, in dental claims, but certainly for personal injury claims, um, you know, it's not unknown for a claim to reach the millions of pounds. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that could relate to uh, a, a dental uh, of course, a dental treatment, and I can't think of one immediately, but for um, just the sake of argument, if the uh, dental treatment provided somehow related um, to the claimant or patient having to be admitted to hospital, um, and that as a consequence they suffer some sort of brain damage, um, then the sorts of figures that I mentioned, five, ten million pounds, aren't that unusual for, for a catastrophic injury claim, um, and that's probably why those figures are set at that level. So if, for example, it, uh, it transpired that you weren't doing things properly and as a result you gave everyone BSE or HIV or whatever, hepatitis, and, and uh, again, you might have, uh, is, it, is that £10 million per patient or is that in the overall sum? Do you know? Generally, from, from my experience, it's, 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 a, it's a cap on the, on the, on the overall amount. Um, I mean, again, you know, it's very rare that you would need to go anywhere near that sort of level if you're making a claim. Um, but from my experience, that is an overall £10 million cap on the liability of the insurers, or £5 million, pounds, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience. Should you really try and talk to the patient after they've made a formal complaint? Because the instinct, I think, in most dental practices, uh, once somebody's complained to the GDC or said that they're going to talk to their lawyers, is literally to not to touch them with a barge pole. I mean, it, would it be a good idea just to jump in your car and drive around there and say, look, what's all this about? How can we, how can we fix it for you at that point? Or what do you think? I think it depends on, on what stage the complaint has reached. Um, as you say, if, if you've got to the sort of GDC stage or a claim, you know, lawyers being involved kind of stage, then I would say keep it distant, keep a distance, keep it professional and deal with, deal with the lawyers or deal with them in writing. But if it's 
purely a case of that you planted this bridge three months ago, it's failed, we're not happy about it. Um, then obviously it's much less formal. You can say, um, please come in, let's have a look, let's have a chat, see what your concerns are, see if we can get those addressed. But if a formal claim has been made or a complaint has been made, then I would suggest you leave it in the hands of your insurers. If you need to speak to, if you need to correspond with the patient, um, then to go via their lawyers or via your insurers, um, but keep it formal. Okay, um, we, we've got another question in, uh, and that's from someone who's saying that um, you said in the presentation that uh, you should always uh, go to the insurers early with a problem, um, but um, there are there is one particular um, insurer who I will call uh, Medical Defence Union because that's what they're called, mm -hmm. um, who are well known for treating every notification as a claim and then claiming, you know, and then saying at the end of the year, no, you've had 12 claims, uh, we're not going to renew. So there is a little bit of a disincentive, isn't there, to go running to the indemnifiers at an early stage. So exactly, you know, when when do you think is, you know, is a good, a good time to go? I think um, if it is likely that this is a patient who is clearly going to take things further, and it's a relatively minor problem that you can deal with um, in-house and you can address the patient's concerns, then not the type of patient who's going to be litigious or take things further, and then it's perfectly acceptable for you to act unless it's deal with it in-house. Um, it's a difficult judgment call. Um, I know some insurers can be difficult. Um, I don't have any personal experience of, of them to you, um, but from my experience of other insurers, they will, if you notify the claim, they'll say, thank you, you complied with your obligations, we won't do anything with it at the stage, but to listen, let us know if anything further develops. Um, it's just trying the right balance between dealing with the complaint, um, which is a, it's a clinician you're entitled to do, but not getting to the stage where you're going to prejudice um, any actions that the insurers may want to take later on. Um, I know some insurers are, are fairly hard line, but I would hope most insurers are fairly reasonable. Um, and I don't, not every single notification, just because you've got a complaint, should necessarily go with them, and you should be punished in the uh, increase in premiums at the end of the year if you do. So, so it's difficult to answer um, on behalf of all insurers, but generally, um, if you think it's going to get going further, then I would urge you to urge, urge on the side of caution, because if you haven't notified them, then you'll be criticised for not notifying, and they won't cover you at all. So it's probably the lesser of two evils to notify and not. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are trying to encourage people to listen to these webinars and join Dental Fusion. So we're offering a discount code to anyone who listens to this podcast, either live or in its recorded form on YouTube. If you enter the code 1971 when buying a membership online at www.dentalfusion.org, then you will get 10% off either practice or associate membership, and this is valid until 31st of December 2013. And don't forget, DCPs can join for a pound. That gives you access to a one-hour free verifiable CPD for watching and listening to the DFO webinars. So that's about wraps it up for today. We've got another one on Wednesday and another one on Friday. I hope this one has been helpful. Uh, but for now, thanks for your time and attention.